Okay, pop quiz. We're gonna play a game called, is it anime? I'm gonna show you a clip and you're gonna tell me, is it anime? So first we got this and I mean, this is the oldest trick in the book. Panty and stocking? Yeah, it looks like a cartoon, but come on. It was made by Gainax, Hiroyuki Yamaishi's team before they made Trigger. So is it anime? Yeah. Of course. The next we got this, which, you know, it looks exactly like anime, moves like anime, but it was made in China. And China's obviously not Japan, so is it anime? No. Even though this looks exactly like any other anime I'd watch. And lastly, we got this, and I think this is pretty obvious. I mean, this is just Batman. It's an American cartoon, so obviously it's not anime. Actually, hold on a second. This movie, Return of the Joker, was actually animated by TMS Entertainment entertainment that featured works from the likes of Hiroyuki Aoyama, who worked on other feature films like Akira. So, um, is it anime? For years now, the debate of what does and doesn't count as anime has been a prevalent discussion in our community that has been plagued with heated debates of how we should correctly label and categorize certain shows. While the technical origins of the word anime is and always has been just the Japanese word for animation, that hasn't stopped it from being used as a label here to describe shows and movies in a certain subculture. The subculture of animation and comics from Japan. And while most people in the fandom knew what you meant when you talked about anime, the exact definition has always been a bit vague. I think there's been enough discussion now around our community that most people are aware that it's not that simple. Whether you talk about breaking down anime by its art style, intended audience, ethnic origin of creative staff, country it was produced in, it's all very muddy. If you have a personal clear-cut definition of what anime is, I guarantee there are dozens of examples that will break your rule or have some shows that fall into your rules that you wouldn't really be happy calling anime at all because that's just how broad this medium is. However, that hasn't really stopped the majority from agreeing that shows like Teen Titans or Avatar, while obviously anime inspired, were not anime as they weren't from Japan. And for the longest time, that was the consensus no matter what discussion points were brought up, with the general agreement being anime is just animation that was made in Japan. Though over time, I've seen that way of thinking slowly change in our community. Right now, it feels like we're in a crossroads where the perception of what anime is and the usage of the word is shifting to the extent where if Avatar had been made in the coming years, I believe there's a good chance it could have been considered an anime as the need to correctly categorize anime and its general definition changes in the current environment. And to understand why, I think it's important to understand why we felt the need to correctly categorize it in the first place as fans. <laughs> I'm sure I speak for a lot of us who grew up watching anime when I say that we were drawn to it because it felt different. I could tell that there was something that separated the likes of Hey Arnold, Dexter's Laboratory, and Ed, Ed, and Eddie to Dragon Ball Z, Digimon, and Card Captors. And when I grew older and actually got properly invested into the medium, anime was this strange, exotic, foreign thing that you couldn't find anywhere else. Not just the art style, it had a unique way of telling stories, directing action, it was weird, it was the only place which did 2D animation that didn't just appeal to kids. And because of this, being an anime fan meant something because it meant that you were into a medium that not many others were. And I feel like this is where a lot of the desire to categorize anime comes from. For the longest time, there wasn't really a concept of a casual anime fan. So when you said you were into anime, there was a clear distinction between these shows and everything else. So even when things like Avatar and Teen Titans came along, there was a simple line we could draw that served as a point of common interest for us to gather around. We were into foreign media that came from Japan and these didn't come from Japan. But things have changed drastically. <laughs> As the fandom and medium have grown, that point of common interest between anime fans has dwindled. Not only has the fandom become a much larger, less unified group, but anime itself has just become a more accepted medium for mainstream entertainment. There are casual fans, there are hardcore fans, you got Christoph Waltz asking Kizuna Ai if she's single, Elon Musk casually wearing a khaki guri shirt. The whole subculture of anime has expanded so far past just the small group of nerds watching these niche cartoons, and its appeal has grown too wide to fit under one umbrella. Not only that, but the industry itself is far closer to our shores than it ever has been. Crunchyroll are on the production committee to a handful of shows every year. Netflix are just straight up funding their own original projects. Radiant is an anime airing right now that is based on a manga made by a French dude. FLCL season two and three were only available in English dub months before a Japanese broadcast. That's right, if Japanese viewers wanted to watch it early, they would have had to watch it with Japanese subtitles. Not to mention the increasing number of international staff members that are now actively working in the industry. Hell, the other day I was lucky enough to hang out with Kevin Penkin, an Australian bloke who composed the soundtrack to Made in Abyss, one of the most critically acclaimed anime OSTs of 2017 that was recorded in a sound studio in Vienna. 
Austria. Huh. The era where anime was this exotic foreign thing that we had no involvement or influence in is dying as other countries get more actively involved and the industry shifts from a purely Japanese one to an international one. And as we see this shift, there's less of a need to strictly differentiate it based on geological origin. It becomes more of a movement. It becomes more of a concept. It becomes... A brand. Something you can't easily describe but can be instantly recognised and marketed as a thing that fits in with the culture we've created. And I don't mean to cheapen the cultural significance and history of Japanese animation, it's just as the medium evolves that's kind of what it's starting to feel like. And I know that's kind of a broad statement so to explain where I'm coming from I'm going to talk about the tale of two shows, Netflix's Castlevania and Crunchyroll's High Guardian Spice. These are two completely western produced shows that have been marketed towards an anime audience that couldn't have got a more polarizing reception. Castlevania for the most part was really well received in our anime community. I've met so many people that had no idea it wasn't produced in Japan and even those who did only had praise for how well it did with its action and animation even paying homage to legendary Japanese animators. So a lot of people even though they know this wasn't made in Japan consider this an anime. And as for High Guardian Spice? <laughs> didn't get the same kind of hype. So really, what's the difference between these two shows? From a production perspective, there's not actually much. Both are Western animation funded by streaming companies in an attempt to produce their own original content that have no affiliation with Japan at all. So the more I think about it, the more I think it's really just down to their marketing and branding. Netflix is an all-encompassing media titan and Castlevania was marketed as an animation that specifically appealed to anime fans. To them, it didn't really matter where it came from. They knew that if you liked this and this then you're probably gonna like this and that's all that really matters so who cares if this shows under the anime tag with all these other shows from their perspective this is anime on the flip side you have high guardian spice where you can blame some of the fault with the lackluster announcement trailer but at its core i think a lot of you will agree with me when i say that high guardian spice just doesn't look or feel like anime at all and there's no inherent problem with this except for the fact that it's being made by crunchyroll so even if it's not their intention to make an anime they can't market this to any Anyone else but an anime audience because it's Crunchyroll. They are the anime streaming service. Their users are there for anime. Anime is their brand. If Crunchyroll had made Castlevania and Netflix made High Guardian Spice, there would be no controversy around it. But as it stands, High Guardian Spice was so far removed from what their audience expected that of course they received backlash for it. And I actually think this was such a simple problem, a lot of the shitstorm could have been avoided if they just branded it a bit differently. Granted, Castlevania is already out and High Guardian Spice has literally one announcement trailer, but I seem to remember that when Castlevania was announced, it was met with excitement and curiosity, and High Guardian Spice won't even be the first American produced show that's streaming on Crunchyroll. But there was no controversy when they made the decision to stream Ruby on their platform, and that just brings me back to my point. There is no technical divide between these two shows, aside from one feels like anime and one doesn't. And if watching Castlevania feels the same as watching all the other seasonal anime that's streaming, who really cares? Going back to Avatar, the reason it was THE show to spark the discussion in the first place was because it was the first show that genuinely felt very anime, despite being produced in America for primarily an American audience. But today? What even is the intended audience when TV is no longer a factor and shows are being streamed internationally in multiple languages? Which is why I think there's been a subtle shift in perception from YOU CAN'T CALL THIS AN ANIME, IT'S NOT FROM JAPAN, to eh. Whatever, I don't care where it's made, I'm still gonna put it in my top 20 list of anime last year. However you view anime, it's hard to deny that we see the anime trademark and branding in a lot more places used in ways that would appeal to our community. Doki Doki was an internet sensation that capitalised on a darker look at waifu culture. You've got League of Legends hiring PA works to make an anime PV for them. Hollywood is trying their damned hardest to make anime work in live action. Shit, if you want to sell me a product, just brand it with some anime waifus and suddenly I'm interested. <laughs> Yeah, I'm that easy, alright? Don't judge me. And this is me only really focusing on Western attempts to appeal to the fandom, but it equally applies to countries in the East. I think it's only a matter of time before we get a breakout hit Chinese anime. I think it's only a matter of time before we get some kind of Korean manhwa adaptation. Hell, having lived in Thailand for the past two years, I've seen some really fucking talented animators in Southeast Asia, so I wouldn't be surprised if something eventually comes out from that region. And when it does, is anyone gonna care if we call this an anime or that an anime? And would 
that stop you from being interested in it? Whether you do decide to separately categorize Manhwa, Manhwa or Webtoons, Castlevania or King's Avatar, there's no denying that these are all targeted towards the anime and manga subculture. It's all the same brand. So the question shifts from does this count as anime to more of is this something that's going to appeal to the anime fandom? Which is what I feel the mentality of future productions will have no matter what country it's made in. In the end, the category of what counts won't be decided by some fictional scholars drawing the line of what is and isn't anime as much as the mods in our anime have tried to do so in the past. It's us. It's what the general consensus agrees on. And the exact word use such as this can shift depending on culture, environment and time. No matter how many times we were told that the word otaku had severe negative connotations in Japan, it didn't stop it from becoming an all-encompassing buzzword to describe anime fans here in the West. Shit, does anyone remember when calling someone a weeaboo was a massive insult? And now everyone calls themselves a weeb. I call myself a fucking weeb. I am a fucking weeb. Even though I've chosen to use the word brand to describe the entity anime is turning into, I don't mean to say that it's just a brand. Anime is, and always will be, associated with Japanese animation, and honestly, I I don't think it should be any other way. But as we move forward, I believe that the clear definition and context we use the word in is just going to get more muddled and broad. Because even if you don't subscribe to the idea that anime should be this all-encompassing word that labels everything that remotely resembles the Japanese shows we grew up with, the deeper you dig, the more you see that from the beginning, anime has always been more than just a single art style, a single genre, a single way of storytelling, a single method of animation. And as time goes on, more than just coming from a single country. Hey guys, before you go anywhere, I do have a quick announcement. This year, I'm going to be guesting at Momocon from May 23rd to 26th. For those of you that don't know, Momocon is an anime, gaming and comic convention in Atlanta, Georgia. With one of the biggest gaming halls in any convention, so if you want a chance of meeting me there, there's a link in the description where you can register. And I'm looking forward to it since it's my first time in that area of the state, so uh, hope to see you there. Anyway, with that said, thank you very much to Carolis Dress. Just Carolis Raswinas, I'm sorry, I, I probably pronounced that very wrong. Epic Mick, Supreme Saiyan, Nicholas Tatum, Mike Elfin, Sisters10086, and everyone else on my Patreon for helping to support me for this month and making this video possible. No further updates from me today, but for future reference, if you do want me to attend a convention near you, the best thing to do is just to let your convention know. I don't guest in too many conventions every year, but I look for any excuse I can to get out of the office every now and then. Anyway, that's it from me. I've been Giguk, and I'll see you all next time.